Hey everyone, and welcome back to Common Sense. Today we're having a conversation I have personally been looking forward to for weeks. The State of the Union with Bowtie Ranger. Ranger, thanks so much for coming on. Thanks for having me. So before we dive into any of the issues, could you just explain a bit about your background, like your military experience and your current profession? Yeah. So without giving away too much information, I spent some time in the, the military I was an army ranger for a bit, went to Afghanistan, got back, kind of realized that the, the war overseas was was turning into, well, it was a forever war, and decided that that wasn't really uh, something that I wanted to continue forward with. Um, and so I, I pivoted out, didn't really know what I wanted to do, had, had the GI Bill as kind of uh, GI Bill and other benefits is kind of tailwind. So I was able to, uh, to go to grad school. And then from there, started to get integrated into the political scene. And then after that, really started taking a proactive and active uh, stance within the uh, sort of conservative, call it new right movement. And I kind of partake in conservative media and entertainment and kind of speak with prominent conservative uh, personalities uh, on Twitter and in real life. So talking about forever war, there's something on a lot of people's minds right now, which is the potential for nuclear war. So in your opinion, what do you think is the most likely outcome for the Russia and Ukraine conflict? Forever war, nuclear war, or we make some sort of compromise? I think a lot of people are asking these questions and I think that you have to really tie it back to the incentives. Like who controls Ukraine? It's not, it's not Ukraine. Mm -hmm. It's the European union and the United States. And what incentive do they have to, to stop the war? Well, the United States doesn't have any incentive. It's not politically unpopular. Most people actually don't care. It's similar to Afghanistan where it took a while to boil that, that pot of water. And get people to actually be upset and and all the meanwhile people had to die and ukraine is flying under the radar you get to make this guy out to be the devil putin and you can kind of continue this this charade for a while all the meanwhile it's it's the ultimate money laundering vehicle for for sort of the the democratic regime and so that's what makes me lean towards the united states wanting forever war now the enemy always has a vote, real threat of nuclear war would make something so unpopular that, that the United States would have to stop its, its charade. And so I think the incentives align to where the United States and kind of European Union elites really want this to continue going until it becomes just politically infeasible. Uh, and, and when I say politically infeasible, similar to Afghanistan, it, it has to become a 75 25 unpopular mm. issue and i don't see that happening i don't see that happening unless uh there there's a real threat of nuclear war mm-hmm. or there's sort of this national populist overtake on on both the right and the left who have common interests you see like there are populists on the left who oppose war not many because you can see the way people vote like even the AOCs and the squad all voted in favor of mm-hmm. of funding the war and continue to perpetuate this sort of this this global trend towards rah rah putin get after putin and um and, and it's it's really boiling the pot on on a global level which could get us troops involved which i think the the regime wants, mm-hmm. uh, but they they also are walking on eggshells around that because they know the second U.S. troops get involved, then that's a different that's a different calculus for uh, the the American voter. So they, that's the only thing that's keeping them out of sending young men and women to die overseas. Do you think if Putin just got Crimea, he would be satisfied and he would stop? Because that's typically what I hear when I argue for a, a compromise is, oh, Putin will never be satisfied. He wants more. He wants more land. What's your take on that? I think it's obvious that that Putin has has sort of expressed a desire to not take the whole, mm-hmm. whole sum of Ukraine. I think he's fine with taking part 
And if you look at any sort of socio-political map of Ukraine, you'd be able to see where he wants and why he wants it. And the vast majority of people in Crimea, if, if you know people from these areas, you know that Crimea wants to be a part of Russia. Mm -hmm. And so, but the, the global elite, they like to claim the slippery slope when it benefits them, and they like to reject the slippery slope when it doesn't. And so you see that with, oh, this absolutist, you, it's a binary one zero. You either get Ukraine or the Western civilization collapses. That's been kind of the way the, it's been framed. Mm -hmm. Do you think the United States should have any role in geopolitical politics of other countries and their conflicts? Do we have a role of pushing democracy or defending equality and freedom in other places? I think I think the United States can play a powerful role in trying to trying to find peace for other other nations. But that's that is such an academic way of wanting a world that you know that that those power dynamics, there's always got to be some carrot and some stick that's attached to every single relation with foreign countries. Mm -hmm. So the regime wants they're always going to be into some sort of conflict. They always want to be. I mean, they, the incentives are aligned so that the senior guys can put up on PowerPoint boogeyman here, boogeyman there, boogeyman everywhere, please keep me to keep me safe mm -hmm. and and i need more equipment i need more money i think to your original question sort of perfect world the united states should just be focused more on creating peace and and i would challenge the character of anybody who was not because world the world changes all the time borders change all the time maps change all the time so to, to think that, that that's fixed in place and that there aren't cultural, social, uh, economic influences that, that will continue to change the world, to think that it's just static or, or locked in, uh, even if it's with your ally, is, is kind of foolish. I agree. And especially when people come in and draw arbitrary boundaries uh, for new countries, like in post-war resolutions, and they don't take into account where the ethnicities are located, that causes ramifications that we're dealing with today. A lot of the conflict in the 20th century and today is because those lines were drawn in between ethnic groups that wanted to live together. Um, but just coming out of college, something that we were taught, or at least presented was the idea of just democratic war or something like that, where you want to put democracies in power because they're more peaceful. So that's the argument for why we need to go into these countries and establish democracies because they're going to be more peaceful than other forms of government. But there's no real basis for that. Why would a democracy be more peaceful? Yeah, I think this idea that, oh, democracy is, is a perfect system or it's the least worst system. Well, is it if it's if it's artificially injected, is that the least worst system? Mm -hmm. Well, who injected it? OK, you think the person that you think the person or, or enterprise that just injected, quote, democracy, which has become its own in and of itself, its own political word. If True. you haven't noticed that, but like democracy and, and our democracy is at risk. Yeah, healthcare and all these have become euphemisms for regime control, mm -hmm. and um, and so when you think of when you think of democracy in that sense, you know it's that catch-all kind of reason that why we should go invade somewhere. It's always a Trojan horse. Democracy. Well, most places like Afghanistan didn't even want democracy. Perfectly content with the way with the way things were run, and and we may look at that and say oh that doesn't that's not compatible with western culture and mm -hmm. they don't care and why should they care and why why do we have to go impose a regime change because when when you talk about like I injecting democracy that's really what you're talking about is mm -hmm. is a regime change when has a regime change ever ended up in in a country flourishing yeah because the regime change is inorganic it's it's artificial Whereas I agree that democracy works when it becomes organic and, and kind of founded in, in natural sort of progression. Hardly anything does work when it's artificially injected. Completely agree. Um, you've been discussing a lot about how the regime has interests in 
continuing endless war. There's a lot of money involved. Do you have any thoughts on the solution to something like the deep state or the regime? People spend their entire lives selling their influence over our lives. How can we reduce at least the scope of their influence without installing something like term limits, which may not be the most efficient form of governance? Is there a way that we can break the deep state? Yeah, I think it, it it's, it's A, going to just take time. And that's the one thing that people need to kind of come to terms with is this idea that we're going to go in there and flip tables is not like that's this isn't a light switch this is not something that's going to happen mm-hmm. overnight there are, are private sector ways that have to happen like conservatives have to build their own institutions you have to build your own media and entertainment infrastructure to provide information to your people i, I always get frustrated when people are like well you know i don't want to make these rules because like then I'm I'm sinking low like the Democrats. And it's like, okay, principled loser. Like have fun <laughs> losing the culture war and have fun providing your kids with a terrible future because you just you wanted to be principal and your total loss. And so you have to you have to adopt tactics that work in culture war. And part of that is identifying your base, building institutions that enhance that base and also builds culture around that too. I actually, my biggest worry for this new right movement is that because the the shit lib overtake of the academia and academic institutions has sort of caused this resentment within the conservative movement towards education, I think education is, is very important. And I don't want the Republican Party or the conservative movement to be the anti-education party. College isn't for everyone, and I think there are plenty of things that we can fix about the system, but I do see rapidly approaching this sort of anti-education, don't go to college, it's all a scam, higher education, all the, all the different branches of academia is a perfect example of, of how that's been a total takeover by, by this sort of shitlib regime of kind of stooges that that go in there and and are just foot soldiers for the regime from the rainbow flags to the pronouns like they they live and speak their their regime state religion and so you have but then you have the conservative response has been well you know let's just drop like pick up our toys and and leave the sandbox and then you've totally conceded education to a bunch of shit libs you're either going to have to own your education which i'm a huge advocate of Or you need to fight back and take back the institution. And you can do that through a number of different ways, starting small, like state and local elections, like school boards, all that stuff. Like it has to start at the grassroots. But that's a perfect example of of like how to overcome the deep state. Well, it has to start at the state and local level, but it also has to have a private aspect too, where you're building, you know, media uh, institutions, you're building uh, the entire culture and all the institutions that go with that educational institution, you have to build these institutions concurrently with the electorate. The electorate's not going to save you. What will save you on the local level is is local politics, which is very, very easy to to dominate. You see that with the 17, 1776 project, which has flipped like a record number of school boards, yep. and they do it with very little funding. And so the institutions must come first then state and local. And then you also using the judicial to get us back on track. You have a number of different like Supreme Court cases, for example, like Elrod versus Burns, which said the government can't be fired due to like political party because Mm -hmm. the First Amendment Association rights. And, you know, you overturn that. And, and it's a different, it's a different calculus for government employees on what they do and say. And then you, you can repeal it from the legislative angle. You can repeal a significant amount of civil service protection for any federal employee involved in policy. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, it's service, right? You have no work, right to work for a government which doesn't want you there. And then I think also from a political angle, you, you can return to a Jacksonian style soil system where, you know, only... The new right can work for new right. And, and what does that look like? Because right now, it's just like, you have, to, you have to understand the battlefield right now. The battlefield right now is only the right can work for the left, and then the left can work for the left. Mm-hmm. 
when you talk about the deep state, you're talking about the guys that are there year after year after year. Right. Well, they're all Democrat. Mm -hmm. Spoiler alert. They're all Democrat. And so you have to ex you, you have to just call it what it is and call it a total political appointee. And uh, basically from the SECDEF and state all the way down to your local assistant U.S. attorneys or HUD administrators, there needs to be a complete churning of, of those individuals to kind of clean out the rot as best you can from a, an executive branch level. And I don't care if people are going to say, oh, well, what about the point of, of continuity? Like, that's the whole point. That's important. Well, that's led us to the situation that we're in. There's a white pill here. It's not going to happen overnight. Mm -hmm. And it needs to happen from a number of different angles, not just the electorate. So in terms of the culture war, when we were saying that we're trying to do a grassroots movement and we're going school board by school board, mayor by mayor, do you think the goal should be to energize the Republican base or try to change people's minds on the left to bring them over to our cause? Or is that a lost cause? I mean, elections are won through the base. And anybody who tries to say, like, win the moderates, win, you know, win the other side over is is just totally ignorant. If you so Trump, for example, Trump in 2016, he was able to get the rurals out. He was able to get the, yeah. the white working class out and like the white working class, just to give you sheer numbers. If you just focus on increasing like the white working class percentage, I'm going to get all these numbers wrong, but they're close. Yeah. Um, if you focus on like increasing the white working class turnout by like two or three percent, you win the electorate by 100 points landslide every mm -hmm. single election going forward. But instead, you have Republicans going to these Democrat plus 60 cities, and they're like throwing their rainbow flags up and BLM signs and their fists up and saying like, look, we're not the real racist. Democrats are the real racist. And literally that moves the needle for no one. Yeah. No one's like, you know what? You're right. Democrats are the real racist. <laughs> like the teams have already been picked. It it does nothing to the electorate. Whereas if you go to these like historical union towns, great example is Butte, Montana, historically legacy union town where grandfather was a Democrat, dad was a Democrat, son's a Democrat. They don't know what's going on in these inner cities with all these drag shows, with child, child drag shows and, and 14 year old girl double mastectomies and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. If you ran a campaign in those towns, and said, here's what your Democratic Party's about. And you showed anti-nationalist edge, which Butte is a historically union town. They're obviously pro-national uh, manufacturing. And so you, you attack it from that angle in, in educating normal people on like what's going on. I spoke to a guy in Montana actually last week. He was like, man, I didn't realize that like child drag shows is actually a real thing. And he's like, we all live in a bubble here. You just have to do essentially a libs of TikTok meets these union towns mm -hmm. who may not be on social media. So that's, that's, I guess, you don't need to appeal to like uh, getting the guy with that puts he, they in their, in their bio to say, you know, like I'll vote Republican because crime's just too much. Right. Like, no, you, you focus on the base and then like those people will, well, a guy with he, they is always going to vote Democrat, but mm -hmm. That, and you have to accept that. And you, you have to like, it's like, it's like when the Republicans are, get super giddy about like appealing to like the black vote or the Hispanic vote. The reason why you're converting in those demographics is because you're strong on social issues, you're strong on economic issues, and, the, and people within those demographics are starting to catch on. But they're not catching on because you're, you're putting out your Democrats, the real racist campaigns. Mm -hmm. If you focus on the issue, the demographics will follow. And I think the Republicans, certainly the RNC sucks at that right now. Why do you think Republicans are not focused on the key issues? I think there are elites that are disconnected from like the average worker, like elite, the, the elite worker disconnect is like on immigration, right? Like mm -hmm. elites benefit from illegal immigration and legal immigration, H1B1 visas, and the, the average American, the middle class and below, it just gets absolutely shafted. Yep. And so that's one thing where you always see these talks of amnesty, like, and, and 
this is what most likely is going to happen. The Republicans are going to, and the Democrats are going to make a push towards legal immigration because it's be quickly emerging as a 75, 25 unpopular thing. Mm. The difference is that Republicans are going to full cock and they're going to be like, well, let's put a wall up. And Democrats are going to say, give us amnesty or give us nothing. And Republicans are going to try to convince their constituents through, you're going to see some sort of euphemistic uh, act where it's like the neocons and, and the, the sort of globalist Republicans will try to make it seem like we're getting a steal. We're getting a really good deal. We get to get our wall and all we have to give up is a little bit of mass amnesty. <laughs> that is is kind of a case study into the disconnect that exists that pe people don't realize especially in border states texas arizona new mexico it is immigration is the issue mm -hmm. it's not a issue and it's certainly not a beneficial like it's not a boon to to those societies it's it's obvious what they're doing if, if there were republicans coming across that that border it'd be a different story it's the same yeah. reason why why Democrats haven't been like, we need to take Ukrainian refugees. Well, if you took Ukrainian refugees and, and then you started getting people to settle heal, here, um, then, you know, they have kids and then their kids get involved. And generationally, it's the same thing as immigration. And the reason they don't do that is because Ukraine is a, a, an ultra conservative, like mm -hmm. they don't even have gay marriage. They're an ultra conservative culture. Um, and... And so same thing with Cuba, like you don't see when the, the Cuba fiasco happens, you, you didn't see uh, Democrats being like, well, yeah, we need to take these refugees. Mm -hmm. There's a reason for that. And that's because the Central Americans that are coming over, they're just they're going to vote Democrat. And because they're big government, because look at Central and South America, they with the exception of Brazil, they all vote left. And and so it's, a, it's actually a smart political strategy. I wish, wish Republicans would have, would have adopted it. And it, it should be the Republicans are like, no, 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 no. We're going to bring in demo graphics that, that benefit us. If, if there's no way to stop the other side from essentially cooking the books, then like, yeah. why, why are we going to just sit by and, and get, get our voter base diluted? Like bring in, bring in the Cubans, bring in the Ukrainians. Like th the only way that you're going to get any sort of like grounded approach from Democratic Party is is when they get the taste of their own medicine. On principle, I don't love the idea of it, but I also don't want to be, you know, like I have kids, like I'm not going to leave my kids with a, a terrible society. The benefit is like a lot of these, a lot of these events where sort of, the lunatic left wing response, like forcing everybody to get vaccines mm -hmm. and making people wear masks and making kids wear masks. You don't even need to campaign too hard on that because that'll convert all the people you need to build a strong coalition because it just defies common sense. Here's some inside baseball. Like a lot of people on the right, prominent people that, that you've definitely heard of, part of their role and they know it. And part of my role, and I know it, is to shift the Overton window. For those who may not know, the Overton window is just the range of ideas that are tolerated within a public discourse. The Overton window, which, which the left has been pushing for years, has made it so that you feel like you're getting a deal when you pay 50 for something you should have paid 25 for, mm. but the left has been pushing for 100 for years and so it now on the right it's like no we're going to pay zero and you're shifting that overton window so that you can normalize a more more conservative outcome so that's that's a key insight to have is is where's that overton window i mean you have child drag shows now that's pushing it to the left right like people are yeah. just like okay you can do drag shows but not child drag shows <laughs> okay you can do child drag shows but it can't be in public school okay well that needs to be observed and and that's why there must be on the right everyone's always like oh well you know like i don't want to be too like far right extreme or mm -hmm. like oh like do you really want to ban uh transgenderism oh do you really like why don't we just live and let live and yep. hold hands and they fail to see the overton window and that 
is from a political strategy and a tactical angle, like you have to have somebody counterbalancing on the right. And you should appreciate those people. You may not believe what they're saying, but you should appreciate those people for what the position that they're taking is because they're they're providing a counterbalance to this absolutely crazy sort of left-wing push toward trying to shift the Overton window left. So if we take this point that the social conservative point of view is the right thing to do, we push the conservative values and we, we fight against the left that is moving that Overton window. We have now given the government potentially, if you let them legislate things like you know, in Florida, for instance, Ron DeSantis is saying things like something about drag queens aren't allowed to go read books to kids, starting to legislate those social issues. You've now given yeah. the government power to legislate on social issues. What happens when the government you don't want is in charge? Well, the whole point in using power is to make it very hard for them to change that. Okay. That's what the left's done, right? And I see this all the time. All the time in my replies is always like, what, if, what about when the Dems use it against us? Dude, the Dems are going to use it against you no matter what. Yeah. So you're going to castrate yourself before the Dems do. You're like, haha, you can't cut my balls off because I already did. <laughs> okay, okay, he, him. Go put your pronouns and go sit in the corner. I'll take care of this. <laughs> That's, that is like my, my initial response. And libertarianism in general is this idea that like live and let live and small government... And it fundamentally gets backwards, this idea of culture and law. And when that happens, then what you do is you essentially say, I don't want to die on big government hill. Mm -hmm. And so people become less involved in government. Think about the paradox of I'm going to go get involved in government so that I can make government smaller. Who the hell does that? Right. Nobody's getting involved in government to make it smaller. And everybody working at the government in these federal regulator positions, these three-letter agencies, they're all trying to keep their job. They're incentivized to make government bigger. And so this idea of like live and let live, I don't care what other people do, that is just asking to get steamrolled. Libertarianism does not just, a lot of times it's, it's shit libs that just want guns. Yeah. But, but there is a strong cohort of people who think that being libertarian is like, the right answer. It's this academic approach that's never been tried in history because it's not feasible, but I, I'm going to adopt this approach because I get to criticize both sides. And it's a totally academic approach um, because you're A, never going to get any skin in the game. You can always criticize both candidates. And B, it's, it's this idea that free markets, all this stuff will dictate culture in a way that will then influence policy and legislation. And that's just not, that's just fundamentally not true. I can appreciate some of the points they make. However, this idea that there are these secular principles that guide like the perfect government, it just makes you sound low IQ. Like free markets will, will fix this. Mm. Free markets will fix this. Free markets will fix this makes sense when you have a bunch of small businesses in a fragmented, decentralized society. But when you have quasi-governmental enterprises operating in the form of big tech, I don't know how you could possibly not see that, that you have this unelected council of uh, truth sayers that are dictating how society operates. And libertarianism just fails to, it fails to make that major distinction between small businesses and large, like large corporations, like libertarians just want to be quote left alone. Mm -hmm. So how could they lead? How could they seize the government, use the government to their benefit and, and use the government to overtake kind of this cultural paradigm shift that's going on in, in society? They can't, they're not going to lead that. They can join the, join our movement as a caucus. That's great. But like, I'm not going to take them seriously beyond that. I came to this understanding relatively recently the idea that there's because i don't want to be seen as self-righteous i don't want to be self-righteous not just perceived that way but i don't want to be i don't want to force my way of life on other people i always was raised on that idea but now i'm thinking more about it and if there is one truth which there is a truth on a number of subjects of course if we disagree on something one of us is more right than the other and so i have a duty to what i think is right to push it 
And that that is completely different than what I believed my entire life. And I think that was from the conditioning of live and let live. Tolerance is king. In terms of the economy, I love to talk about this one point that Tucker Carlson made where, you know, they're going to automate all of the truck driving jobs in the United States. So that's better for the economy. That's what Ben Shapiro would say. You'd say it's better for the economy because you have more efficiency, more surplus for everybody. Tucker Carlson would say, what about the 8 million trucker jobs that are gone? I would defend those. I would codify in law that they can't be automated away. That makes sense to me that you protect 8 million jobs over the sake of some minimal amount of surplus. What do you think about that? Yeah, the, you know, the the fundamental talk about fundamental truths within libertarianism. The fundamental the biggest fundamental truth is that they believe that GDP is the biggest indication yeah. of happiness. Yeah. That's that's where they get everything wrong because they think because truly the the free market system is the way to maximize GDP and therefore GDP must be the biggest indication of happiness and health of a country. And that's uh, that's just fundamentally wrong. Go look at places like Hungary. Go look at places who don't place GDP at the highest priority, who would rather create beautiful buildings than right. the most cost efficient buildings. And, and when you look at that and you see these people are actually really happy. And then when you look at the number of number of people on antidepressants and anti-anxiety pills yeah. and people consuming Adderall nonstop in the United States, like that GDP guys, GDP is going up. As long as that GDP is going up, then we should be, we, it should be okay that you're taking Adderall. It's okay. Free markets will fix this. Go take your SSRIs, go take your Adderall and, you know, individuals are rational players or something. Like everything you've just talked about in our society is just, it's that mantra of capitalism, GDP. And I don't want to sound like some crazy socialist leftist because I'm not, but it has to be some protections for people's rights and what actually makes you happy in a healthy society. And we have we have none of that with that libertarian point of view. It, it really comes down to like, how do you measure the health and happiness of a society? Mm -hmm. How do you measure that? And, you know, the shit libertarian response is like, well, if we're not measuring GDP, then how are we measuring it? I don't know. Go talk to people. Go see what's valuable to them. Family, pretty valuable. How are we doing on that? Well, GDP, like we want abortions so that women can stay in the corporate workforce exactly. because we need to ramp that GDP up. So like let free markets figure it out. Okay. What about the imminent societal like collapse that's impending because, because people aren't having enough kids? Free market will figure that out. Okay, well, we're seeing how the free market's working that out in Japan. Like Japan is, Japan's like on the brink of total civilization collapse because they just didn't have enough kids and their immigration is very strong. When you replace the family and the household, focus on the middle class, when you replace that with just creating GDP and that's ushered in by large, influential, powerful corporations that want to increase profitability and, and then the politicians and all that get to like ride this whole GDP line. When you do that, you're replacing things that make people happy in life with GDP. And, and there's no other way to cut that onion. And, and this idea of like conservative values, conservative values are just Christian values. Yeah. And, and when you think about left's values, they are artificial Christian values. And what do I mean by that? They call things human rights. When you look at it throughout history, the idea that there could be humans that are equal, mm -hmm. that didn't exist before Christianity. And that Absolutely. didn't exist in cultures that weren't Christian cultures. Mm -hmm. This idea that human rights, international human rights, which is like the secular way of, of trying to like commandeer this, the, like Christianity and Christian values that have been espoused in the Bible and for thousands of years and now secularized. It's, it's this sort of hijacking of the Christian values and tenets and trying to like, like secularize it, make it so that it's not Christian. It's not Christian to think that everybody's equal. There isn't a society that existed in history that didn't view humans as above or below other humans. Yes. That's just factually correct. That all changed uh, when, when Christianity started, started catching fire. And so it's always interesting to hear the left talk about human rights as if as if Christians didn't found human rights. And, I never and thought about they, that. That's so true. They always try to twist Christianity 
like say, well, what would Jesus do? As if Jesus was this Bernie bro who would, would like go along with whatever and tolerance, bro, transgender, drag queens, bring the kids, we're tolerant. And it's like, no, God doesn't not punish people. Mm -hmm. God doesn't not hold people accountable. In the Bible, it just says this, like God doesn't just run like this loosey goose sort of, oh yeah, you know, like drag queens, that's fine. In so many words, law is derived from this, this sort of moral, moral conviction that transcends any sort of political body. That like, even if the government didn't say that murder was illegal, that like murder should be, uh, like wrong and, and not not committed mm -hmm. legal positivism which has only really taken root since the scientific revolution which a lot of these sort of reddit know-it-alls kind of prescribe to like kind of replace natural law this idea that law comes from god and and comes from um sort of a theological underpinning to this idea that law comes from the government whatever the government says is what goes on and that is it do whatever the government says and unless the government says that it's illegal it's not it's not illegal mm -hmm. and so it's sort of the whole scientific revolution and, and all of that has sort of just it's kind of been the creation of of uh the creation of the the reddit atheist um this sort of know-it-all person who's got it all figured out and has this academic idea of everything because they've read a few books and it's it's uh it's really disappointing to see because that's the direct like the same direction of these people are like pronouns in bio reject masculinity and 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 totally engulf yourself in eating crickets living in a pod and embracing secular hedonism to the umpteenth degree yeah totally ironically they try to make things like a abortion human rights right and, it, and it's like there's nothing really there's nothing that is constant there's no God that is constant. It's ever changing. It changes with what feels good and what doesn't. And, and GDP for many people, because you'll talk to a lot of cuck conservatives who will start quoting like Freakonomics said that, <laughs> you know, abortion makes us more productive as a society. Uh. It lowers crime. It increases GDP. And I think, I think that's the most cucked response to a social issue um, that I could manufacture, but I don't manufacture it. Plenty of people produce it organically on their own. And really what it is, is you have these, these really weak males who have ultra liberal wives who were probably, were probably attractive in their heyday. And that's why these tucked guys tucked. And they just like have been totally castrated over the years as, as wife just yells in their ear about stuff that, that they don't care about because all they're doing is trying to make money. It's the, it's the average suburban male is what I'm describing. Like this sort of cope where it's like, yeah, the missus keeps yelling at me about abortion. So I'm going to kind of reverse engineer like a logical conclusion to, to why abortion okay. Yes, I, I completely relate to that, especially in my age group. Like the girls are completely lefty and the boys are pretty apolitical. But when they start dating, suddenly the boy gets pulled way to the left. He starts posting the black square on Instagram and he posts about Roe versus Wade like a normal kid. All of a sudden is posting about Roe versus Wade on his Instagram story like a 22 yeah. year old male. Like that's that's disgusting. I have no respect for that whatsoever. I feel like there's this idea that. Your rights come from the government now. No, my rights don't come from the government. The government doesn't let me do things. My rights come from God. I was made equal to everyone else in his image and likeness. And the government's job is to protect those equal rights. They're not supposed to do anything else. And that is completely lost in the name of progress. So I completely agree with you. Whatever needs to be done today, even if it infringes upon those rights, it's necessary and needed. Yeah, and, and it's, it's, it's the classic Trojan horse where you know, take this vaccine, it'll, it's for your own, it's for grandma, or it's for yourself, or take, uh, hey, get, take the guns, it's for safety. Safety has become a tro total Trojan horse. And then like, there's no, there's no risk assumption. And it leads to this idea that like, the rights do come from the government. Yeah. And I think, I think that's starting to change, because I think the pendulum on the culture war is starting to push back. Like, I think the, the rebels of my age group, or I'll go into church 
the new en vogue it's not en vogue what's en vogue is to like be crazy and dye your hair purple and go protest in the streets but the the rebel the underground now they go to church on sundays and they like have dinner with their mom yeah men and women play a role in this whole thing and and like women at their core are more culturally conforming than men you can look at it in a number of ways. I mean, perhaps there's some biological explanation for it because women are more vulnerable in society. Like they're small, physically smaller. Mm -hmm. They're not as strong as men. Men used to be the ones that were more immune to that, that were more like, no, I'll go blaze my own trail. Like, I don't agree with this. Like men are like physically stronger. They're, they've typically been the, the spear chuckers. So they just have less risk to assume by being more countercultural. What we're seeing now is how the most powerful group in the United States and in the world is young, the young masculine male. They're the most courageous. They're the ones that are the most, most adept at being critical of like things that aren't going well. And they're the most likely to, to have the idea of like, logically, like, this is not good for society. Logically, why is it not good to have like pronouns posted is because it enters in this fallibility of, of, of gender construct, that gender can be changed, that I have to put my pronouns there. And by doing so, I'm impliedly saying like gender can be changed. And that's why you see guys like Andrew Tate getting, getting canceled is because he's the, he was the most, many could argue that he was the most powerful guy maybe in the world, because he had such a market share of the youth, the young male. Suburban moms hated that. They hated that. And Jordan Peterson is another one, although I disagree with Jordan Peterson on a lot of stuff. I, mm. I, he attracted a lot of younger, like masculine males. And you got this half black guy, Andrew Tate, being like, yeah, it's BS. Mm. And, and Andrew Tate, say what you want about him, but like, if you listen to some of his stuff, he is, he makes very compelling arguments in the same way that a lot of Jordan Peterson's earlier stuff makes very compelling arguments. And so, um, so having market share of the direction of your young masculine males historically that have been the, the ones that go to war, right? Mm -hmm. Like you own market share of telling people to not join the military, like the young masculine, the 20 year old male who um, is hungry for adventure and has energy, like you have market share of influencing that demographic to do one thing or another, you're the most powerful person in the room. How, what the direction of the young masculine male is, has, has traditionally always dictated where the country goes, how strong a country is, how strong its military is, like that, that will be the, the backbone of, of any sort of countercultural change is gonna come through the sort of younger male demographic. Women are a much better reflection of where culture is currently at. When I want to get a litmus test for a society and where that society's values are, I'll go look at women because they'll dress the part. Mm. They'll talk the part. You know, how is society now? And when you look at the women now, you see a lot of women who are ultra left wing, like clearly getting influenced by the regime's foot soldiers and bootlickers like Taylor Swift and like, all these mainstream like singers and, and dancers. And so you can see like that that is starting to change because I'd say 10 years ago, I don't think there'd be a market for a conservative dating app, but now there is. Now that women are, are shifting in that direction, now that you're seeing the market shift, that's indica indicative of the world changing, or like not the world changing, the United States, Western society is, is kind of changing. And what does it look like at each generation? I think it's changing. I think it's quietly changing. I think it's subtly changing. The suburban moms are, you know, between wine bags, they're, they're complaining about hubby and, and why he needs to make more money. And then they're also complaining about what son is listening to and why he's not, why he's not being more inclusive because that's, that's the way like the suburban wine mom kind of operates is like, she's trying to conform to, to the, the culture that she's engulfed in, which is more left-wing politics. I think part of the reason why younger women 
are moving more to the right is because they can look at their older cousins, their older sisters, their aunts that are 35 and they are the product of the sexual revolution and they're unhappy and they, you know, they were promiscuous in their youth and it's difficult for them now to find a good guy. Like there are so many examples of that around us all the time. And it's it's clear that it didn't work. It didn't work. So now people are like, oh, I, I don't want to go anywhere near that. And there's people yeah. on YouTube that are having impact. Yeah, I think I think that that's I think all that's right. I, I would add on top of that that I mean, you see it with abortion. Yeah. You see, that was like a super sensitive topic for a lot of women. And when the Dobbs case came down, you started seeing like a lot of women were like, I had an abortion and I'm proud of it. And it's like every time you hear that, you, you see that they look for validation. I, I went to go look at um, what academia in like the 90s and early 2000s talked about before it was before it was eternally corrupted. The number of women who regret having abortions that this is not talked about here's something that's i not completely talked about, agree that the number of women that have abortions that regret it like i've talked to people that have had abortions and they remember the birthday yes. they remember when their son should have been born they remember that their son should have been seven years old and every time they see a seven-year-old running around it's a reminder to them oh my gosh and they live with that for the rest of their lives that is more damning to women than anything else is to put a ball and chain associated with murder. This is, this is beyond that. This is, you're supposed to grow that person. You're supposed to develop that person. You're supposed to meet them at different benchmarks. And so this whole idea is so ironic when people are like abortion rights or women's rights. And it's like, this is the most destructive thing that you could do to the, the female population just given how depressed and anxious and like, look at the SSRI rate and like, yeah. look at, a large minority of women are on some sort of cope drug. Like if we just take what I said about women being women offering a look into the, the actual health of a society, health of a culture from that angle, and are women happier now than they were in the 50s? I don't know. They're on a hell of a lot less drugs. I don't think they committed as many suicides back then. Women over the years more and more go on drugs. Here's the big number that they brag about. Like one in four women have had an abortion. Any correlation? Any causation? Why are women looking weirder and weirder every day? Why are women looking and sounding more and more unhappy every day? Society is, quote, progressed by left-wing standards. We've become more tolerant. We weren't doing drag shows in the 90s. Yeah. You know, we didn't call pedophiles minor attracted persons. Why, why are women not happier now? And... It's because society and culture is decaying and women are a manifestation of that because they're the ones con conforming to that decay. I, I could not agree more on this abortion point. I have a friend who at her church, she does abortion grief counseling and it's horrible. It's horrific. And the culture is preying upon young women, 17 year old women, 19 year old women, encouraging them to do nothing else than make this absolutely permanent decision that haunts so many people. Every one of these factors, you know, the promiscuity that's encouraged by our culture, all of these things, they prey upon young women. And it's in a lot of ways, things that they can't come back from. If you decide not to have kids before 33, 34, like you can't come back from that. If you have an abortion, you cannot come back from that. There are permanent decisions that prey upon young women in a way that men, you know, if you're a soy boy addicted to porn, you can watch Andrew Tate and follow Bowtie Ox for three years and you're a different guy. Women do yeah. not have that luxury. And that's why I'm so incensed by this this topic and all the topics about women, which is why I do so many on my channel. Like, you Well, you know why that is, is because it's because women are the easiest prey. When you have, you know, barstool conservatives like Dave Portnoy being like, women need to be able to get abortions so that I can make sure that I don't have to pay child support. Yeah. Like, that's not because he cares about the health of women. It's because he literally doesn't want to pay for abortions. And so you have these destruction of the masculine male becomes incredibly destructive on society as a whole. When you yeah. have your most prominent male figures in society shifting from guys like, like Theodore Roosevelt, like to guys like Dave Portnoy, and that's who the young 20 year old men are looking at. And so you can see how like the, that males play a role and females play a role. The role is separate. 
Mm. Um, but I also think that women, like female influencers, are playing a, a different role than society's ever had. I think that that's led to a lot of women kind of shifting to the right is because yeah. there have been courageous women who who will say like this is this is BS like the the child drag shows no and I don't care if you call me whatever name you want to call me I don't care so and that takes courage because again I don't think it's in female instincts to like to like stick up and and fight the mainstream like well, you want to avoid conflict That's you, you want to avoid conflict yeah like for all the reasons like all the biological reasons that we've talked about and and that's just the way that humans have developed over time i think that 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 social media is has played a role in having kind of this growth of the female influencer on the right that's made women feel more comfortable with if not being outspoken about it, at least feeling comfortable in their own skin with having those convictions. Yeah. I, I'm i really shy, kind of, in like big group settings. And in the past two years, it's just been too freaking crazy for me to keep my mouth shut. And so I've, you know, really been putting myself in a position where I haven't been before, where I've been honest about my opinions. And you get a lot of flack. And the social conditioning on the female side is much stronger than it is on the male side, I would argue. The amount of courage it takes for a male to do it versus a female to do it is also like vastly different. Like, yeah. like risk that a female feels when they do something like women are more vulnerable. And so it is, it is, it takes a larger amount of courage to be able to get over those hurdles. And that doesn't get talked about because everybody in society now wants to be this androgynous women and men are the same. They can be the same. They can do all the same, 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 same. And it's like, we've declined ourselves into this lunacy that is um, creating this sort of androgynous figure. That's like, well, I don't know if they're a man or a woman. Uh, I, you know, five minutes into the conversation, you're still like, I'm pretty sure it's a female. <laughs> um, and, and like that it's, you know, society is trying to make women more masculine and men more effeminate. And, and that in and of itself is, is, is part of the, the destruction that we're seeing. But we have some people who are running who are supposedly not neocons. And as we go into the midterms, I'd love to hear your thoughts about how successful they're going to be. So in Congress, we've got people like Blake Masters in Arizona, J.D. Vance in Ohio, Joe Kent in Washington. Dr. Oz is a necessary seat, but I don't know if you would call him a new writer. And then you got Carrie Lake as a governor candidate in Arizona. Any thoughts or ideas about how these guys are going to do? Yeah, I'll start Northwest, move South, and then move East. Okay. Um, Joe Kent is going to likely win his race. Awesome. He's a good person. And it's awesome to see guys like that who... We're just really tired of sitting on the sidelines. Uh, I've spoken to him a couple times, and he's he's genu genuinely a good person. He'll be a rock star in Congress. And uh, Carrie Lake and Blake Masters in Arizona. Here's a hot take. I think there's a strong argument to be had that Carrie Lake would be a better torchbearer of the sort of MAGA or New Right movement than Ron DeSantis. She's a good proponent of all the all the sort of MAGA, New Right, sort of popu national populist is really national populist is probably the best way to describe yeah. the the cohort that exists. Um, it's people that are tired, like that that want to wield power because they realize that it's sort of the anti-libertarian. Like it's it's this idea that. If you don't take the hill, they're going to take the hill. And if they take the hill, they're going to make sure that you never get up that hill again. Yep. And, and the populist understands that. The populist understands that unless you are fighting and seize that hill and constantly playing offense, that you're going to be playing defense from a valley. And good luck playing defense in a valley against an enemy that's, that's on the hill. The three main hard powers, food, security and energy like those three things like that's the purpose of government is to preserve those things yeah it's not to provide those things it's to preserve those things make sure yeah. that that their societies have those things and if their societies don't have those mm -hmm. things you have things like sri lanka that happen mm -hmm. you have things like the european union with the energy crisis that happen you have total instability 
And so those are the three hard powers. And I think that's the, that, that's like the nationalist sort of twist to the populist movement is, is, you know, strong, strong borders, strong, uh, on shoring and, and bringing back, um, manufacturing and, and, and the like law is more important than, than culture. And we can talk about that. And people mm-hmm. always say like, Oh, law is down or legislation is down. It's, like a common kind of shit libertarian way of of approaching life but like that that's just fake that's just fake and look at look at gay marriage look at um look at abortion like look at like the supreme court manufactures this this right abortion out of thin air Mm -hmm. and and look at how the polls change look at how the polls change california voted no on on gay marriage on a referendum in i think 2008 California, the most shit lib state in the union, voted no in 2008. Then Obergefell happens. And all of a sudden, everybody's like, well, okay, like gay marriage, okay. And so this idea that like laws downstream or legislation should be downstream from culture, like no, law and legislation will in many cases dictate culture. Mm-hmm. And and when you, when you try to like, when you seed that hill to the other side the other side is going to dictate the terms and i think carrie lake is a good steward of of that sort of uh movement if you will and she's crushing it Mm -hmm. now it'll be interesting to see how she governs i think she's likely to win she gives these sort of one-liners and and responses um which need to be pushed back because we're in a culture war and she's very good in how she messages in in how she carries herself the thing about carrie lake is she looks like she's always having fun and yeah. that is very difficult to hate blake masters is a coin flip it's very difficult to do, defeat an incumbent and and one that sort of has the profile of mark kelly and blake masters has been fighting name recognition but it, i it, it'll come down to the wires and really just like every democratic race uh, on the federal level, it's it's a game of survival. And you mm-hmm. see that with Fetterman and Oz in, in Pennsylvania, where it's this, I'm losing, I'm losing market share, I'm losing voter share every, every week, can I survive? And I think that it, it'll be a buzzer beater for, uh, if Blake Masters does win, it'll be a buzzer beater for him in Arizona. The uh, Oz in Pennsylvania, like, everybody's like, well, you know, like, I'm tired of getting all these swamp rats and the uh, in office and it's like you don't have the luxury you had your chance in the primaries to voice your opinion you just need you just need asses and seats at this point Mm -hmm. because the reality is is like does does oz care about half the things he says no but oz will vote in lockstep 90 percent of the time right now it's just we need asses and seats and here's some more inside baseball to how sort of the influencer kind of ways work like you'll see instead of somebody endorsing Oz, they'll just attack Fetterman more. Right, right. And so that they can sort of preserve their anti-Oz approach, but they know that, like, if they don't get involved, that that needle might might not be working to the best of, like, what, what the outcome that we all want is, which is a Republican-controlled Senate, even if there are, there are cucks in that. So that's, um, and then you have, you know, there, there are, there are a surprising number of, of races that people aren't talking about that I think, I don't think they're going to be, I don't think they're going to be Republican wins, but I think there'll be statements. And you look at the Oregon governor, look at, um, the Washington Senate, like look at the Colorado Senate and look at the New Hampshire Senate. And all these are, they're, they're going to look like. New Jersey did in 2021 Mm -hmm. where it was within a point or two and that is these are notorious like these are these are shit lip states like this is where the the white liberal affluent women uh breed in these states and so um and and so it's a real it's a statement to see these numbers closing in these states and uh and it's exciting so do you think that We take the Senate. Yes. Okay. Because nobody, everybody's focused on 2022 and 2022 is great, but like people need to really take a look at the 2024 map. The 2024 map looks 
there is an above zero percent chance that Republicans take a super like a filibuster proof super majority. majority. Oh, not super majority it'll be it'll be 60 plus but like assuming that it's like 52 or 53 in 2024 you have west virginia that's these are all like currently democratic right party seats and listen to these states montana ohio arizona nevada wisconsin mm. those are very likely to be red that is six states and then a to you know a toss up would be would be Michigan or Pennsylvania or Virginia even um, like Glenn Youngkin for example who's extraordinarily popular in Virginia there there isn't a zero percent chance that that he pushes it'll probably be a, it'll most likely be a a twenty twenty six run but. Um, but somebody of that that stature could run in Virginia and conceivably flip that seat red. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's nine seats. So people aren't talking about that nearly enough that like 2022 represents. Yeah, it's it's a must win situation. But like there's you have to be a white pill here because this country is conservative as as long as Republicans don't completely shut down and, and just suck. Like there's the, the electorate will shift. That is a very interesting fact that it is not a 0% chance that Republicans have a filibuster proof Senate. Now with a filibuster proof Senate, you can, you can lock in nine Supreme court justices. You yeah. can make it so that they can't, you can make that law. You could pass an outstanding immigration bill. Um, 2024 is, it, it looks very favorable. Well, that's an uplifting point of view. That's new. That doesn't happen all the time. My concern was when we lost 2020 and we lost the Senate, we lost the House and we lost the presidency, that they were going to, they don't play by the rules. They were going to pack the court. They were going to abolish the filibuster, add states, create one party rule. So even if your more favorable 2024 situation doesn't happen, eventually the pendulum will swing back. Is our only hope to rely on the Joe Mansions of the world who can stop the tyranny in its tracks? Or is there a way for everyone to play by the same rules again? You think it's just to codify it when we do have power? You have to look at incentives. Why are Democrats incentivized to play by the rules when they're, they get away with not playing by the rules? That is the ultimate, that's the ultimate question on can we play, can we play fair, fair ball here or not? I say this kind of tongue in cheek, but but part of me is like it would be way easier to just do a hostile takeover of the Democratic Party than it would be to change the Republican Party. That that is uh, partially true because they just want they have the the motivation to win. Mm. They have the winning mentality, and and yeah, they have the institutions to back them up, and they have this sort of mainstream elite uh, like the Taylor Swifts pushing all the kids to go vote and all that stuff, but like. That's all a that is all just an outcome of them wanting to win is they took the institutions over mm -hmm. that relying on Joe Manchin or even Tulsi Gabbard for anything is is not that is not going to yield a very favorable result because you have to understand they're coming from their states. Right. Joe Manchin's vote can flip one way or the other if. If Chuck Schumer approaches him and says, I'll give you a disproportionate amount of aid for mm -hmm. West Virginia, which is a very impoverished uh, state and could use it. And so Joe Manchin can then vote for the child drag shows because he just tripled his state's aid right. in some fat bill that nobody's going to read. You, and so relying on and saying like Tulsi Gabbard, everyone, she's great in foreign policy, but she wants to take your guns just as much as as uh, Nancy Pelosi and and Joe Biden mm -hmm. and like and that people shouldn't let that go like same thing with I mean it's it's always like uh, and Mike Cernovich makes this he calls this out too it's like there's so much focus on like these these Democrats who once in a while will trip trip up and say something that's like not not shit libby and. Uh, like you see with Bill Maher and like he'll he'll trip up and say like 
maybe the child drag shows aren't good and everybody's always like yeah yeah look guys look at how based this clip is mm. and it's like this dude is is not going to change the way he votes he's not going to change really anything and he's he's just merely trying to make it so the democrats are slightly more winnable so that that democrats don't just have these absolute lunatics that they have somebody who's like can appeal to the quote moderate democrat which might not exist anymore and it's it's always cringe when you see people just sharing retweeting all these like bill mayor like oh he he called out like children getting locked down and it's like like watching like little monkeys clap their symbols yeah. over this guy who who hates them i have a real problem with you were just bringing up like he was against the covid lockdowns against kids i have a real problem with the people who are republicans who are currently in office who did nothing at the time and they haven't really there's been no apology there's been no walking back of their previous statements like ben shapiro just came out about the vaccine he said we were lied to we were lied to I was looking through his tweets on the subject like he was he was pushing the vaccine back in yeah. December of 2020. I have a real problem with that. And I think a lot of people do. Where's the consideration of the part that you played? You could have looked at the data. Alex Berenson looked at the data. Why couldn't Ben Shapiro and The Daily Wire do that? Yeah, I mean, The Daily Wire, it, like aside from Matt Walsh and Michael Knowles, I mean, and Candace Owens, The Daily Wire has a thin bench. Yeah. Um, the it's mostly like this sort of libertarian i mean look they cocked when it came to like the disney versus desantis mm -hmm. um brawl and they were like oh pro disney and like jeremy boring was pro disney during that that scuffle and it's just super cringe and they're like free markets free markets free market i mean it's a typical it's a typical libertarian kind of approach so i wouldn't put too much weight in the daily wire as being the the bastion for conservative values um but i agree that there are a lot of people on the right i mean like when you really think about it the the only person that voted against the cares act was thomas massey yeah that's the only person that stood up that's i mean that talk about courage mm -hmm. i think everybody got hoodwinked I mean, tactically, it's hard for politicians to admit error. It's only when it becomes a 75-25 issue that people are going to really demand them admit error. Because when they admit error, then it affects people's judgment of them. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, I, I, it'd be great to hear somebody like Marjorie Taylor Greene, who really puts it, you know, puts it all out there, uh, say, like, this was a, a huge mistake to do this instead she says like oh the the cares act was the right thing to do in you know instead of um or because the government was like locking down like it was right to to take care of businesses which the yeah sure that makes sense but you why was the government locking down over over yeah. this <laughs> why was every why were there so many people like why did why don't you admit that that this was just a bad idea and and i agree i i don't have a great answer to that how people responded to covid and how people respond to crises in general best captured by covid that was that was kind of the test for the next decade for me anyway it was like okay how did they how did they respond during covid they were they were talking about safety, you know, mm -hmm. code words for regime control like safety, healthcare, and mm -hmm. and oh, it's you know for grandma. Arguably, it was equally Republican as it was Democrat, given the bipartisan support for for all this. Now there were states that quickly, like Georgia, Georgia opened up quickly, and that that's run by like a neocon, mm -hmm. and. But and Trump criticized him big time, big time. And then he criticized Florida, too. And Texas, like the idea was that Georgia was undermining um, Trump's sort of covid response. And so so that's why he got upset. But like you can see how it's all political. I mean, call it what it is. It was it was like a flu on steroids. Yeah. And nobody really cared that, that that was what we were arguing about. They were arguing about like how, the optics. If the government's making businesses locked down, that the government should compensate businesses. 
It's yes, I agree with that. Let's take one step back. If the why is the government locking down to begin with? And nobody's really provided a solid answer to that, aside from Thomas Mass, who brings it up maybe every week. <laughs> the reason why I bring it up is because in my cohort of younger adults and teenagers, I think that there's a massive percentage of us that are pretty nihilistic now that are like, uh, we got locked in our house. If they do it again, like I have Netflix, I have TikTok, you know, Social Security, I'll never get it. They're going to tax me for the rest of my life. Whatever. I can't do anything about it. And then there's a small percentage of people who are pissed. Like they're really pissed at Republicans, Democrats, the entire institutions. And they're very active about it. And they have no faith in people that are currently in power, no matter what color uh, their party is. And I think it's fascinating. Gen C gets a lot of shit. And I mean, rightfully so. But 95% of them are on TikTok all day. They're on YouTube all day. They're not doing anything. But there's 5% of them that are using everything at their disposal, every book, every feature of the internet. They're making money. They're talking to people that are very, very active. And that 5%, I would argue, is so sick of this regime. And I think that they're going to have a big part in this next decade. And it's because of COVID. Yeah, I one another one of my hot takes is like, do I think there was election fraud in 2020. Yeah. But mm -hmm. do I think that Trump Trump's handling of COVID affected the electorate? Yeah. I, I think that's, that is just really overlooked that every single person that I've talked to who is pro Trump, like they were really upset with how he handled COVID. Now, now the way the, the cope that goes into that, depending on how much of an ideologue you are, um is well you know he he worked with the best he had at the time or mm. he empowered fauci for whatever reason like as if trump wasn't smart enough to know that that these people were going to seize power and try to oust him and now oh you, you got you got hoodwinked by by anthony fauci like no this this was clearly foreseeable if, uh, if you hand over the reins of this country to to do, like to fauci and burks they're going to run this country into the ground. Burks and Fauci are lifers in in the D.C. swamp. And mm -hmm. this isn't like this isn't brand new. Like everybody know, knew this. Back to that 2020 loss in the presidential election. So you mentioned that you thought there was some voter fraud. How confident can we be in our elections here on out? Voter fraud doesn't happen really, but in a few counties within states that have more than 50 percent of their population in one city yeah. so like illinois, illinois is a great example where like they population of 18 million 10 million are in chicago where chicago basically elects who runs that state minneapolis and minnesota are the same way and you have these these political machines that essentially exist in these cities and it's no it's no secret like there have been New York Post articles and a bunch of investigative reporting around like ballot harvesting and, and all that stuff that happens in these cities where there's a high density of people. Um, and it, it's very easy to do things like go throughout a nursing home and just like clean house on the ballots and like take all these geriatric old people and like have them write their name and sign their name and then you fill out their ballot and this isn't a conspiracy. There have been really fascinating um, investigative sort of journalists uh, pieces on this. So that's that's what people need to get out of their head is like the state and local elections, unless you live in one of those states where it's like, like South Carolina is a, a probably good example. Like how much fraud is happening in South Carolina? Probably some, just like there's like no process is perfect, but like, I don't think a meaningful amount. You need to focus on on governing these these like democratic political machines that exist in these these big cities. Like, how do you counteract that? Well, try to get involved in those cities as much as possible. Try to create coalitions of counties, like rural counties, to where you're going to hold your releasing ballot information until until the cities uh, release. Because what the cities do is they'll release some. And they'll wait to see how much margin they need to overcome, find the margin so that it's not obvious and sort of slowly creep it into uh, into the vote count. And so, like, there there are ways to counteract that. But it 
it can't just be like you sitting on the sideline. Um, Democrats just want to get involved, more involved in government. That's at its core. Democrats want to just get more involved in government and, and Republicans and this sort of libertarian movement that they just don't want government to be big. And like, that's, that is kind of the primary issue at hand. And that's why we're, we're in the situation we're in is because the side that wants the government to begin is going to get involved. And when you get, when you get involved in government, you can make, you can change government. And as I explained before, like law and legislation and regulation is that dictates culture more times than not. I really agree on this law point, which I don't think gets discussed enough, especially on Twitter or on social media. So I really want to talk about some of those Supreme Court rulings and just the overturning of Roe versus Wade, which has just been a monumental thing, of course. So as I was studying this in college, there was an issue of precedent. The Supreme Court is supposed to uphold precedent. That's how it retains its legitimacy. The beloved John Roberts even said that once the Supreme Court decides on a super controversial issue, the matter should be closed. That's it. It's over. That precedent should rule. Obviously, I see uh, several issues with such a, <laughs> a phenomenon as that. How do you think the Supreme Court should deal with poorly decided previous precedents? You, you do the hard right answer over the easy wrong answer. Like two wrongs don't make a right. You have to make it right. This idea that abortion rights are human rights, just manufactured out of thin air in sort of this activist judicial branch in the mid 20th century, this idea that it was manufactured and then because it was manufactured, we just must abide by it is, I mean, you want to talk about anti-democratic, like that is, that is the most, they, these people weren't even elected. They're the ones that are dictating the issue of abortion. Until Democrats change their tune, I'm, of course, going to shift the Overton window and say, if it benefits me, I don't care about the process. Because unless I say that, the Democrats will just continue to push that. And I mean, it's just like kind of in the blood of the left. And so set all that aside. If you have an unelected body of, of judicial activists, academic types on top of that, like the worst type of people who who should be like dictating what the law is. That's a huge problem. Like imagine having a bunch of law school professors dictating what the laws should be. How garbage of a society would that be? Now you could make the argument that like the current politicians are the equivalent or Supreme court, like then what role does it make? Like Dobbs project protects the legitimacy of the court. Roe didn't. Roe is a made up decision that stole the people's voice on abortion and gave it to nine unelected rogue judges who think they know better without any textual or historical basis in the constitution. And even, even Kagan admitted this. So by giving the people their, their, their day back by giving people their voice in the legislation process, the court begins the process of restoring its own sovereign authority and legitimacy. I completely agree with that understanding of legitimacy. Unfortunately, there's a bunch of people who don't understand it that way because they don't understand what Roe versus Wade did. They don't understand how it was made up. They don't understand what the overturning of Roe versus Wade means. So if the power of the Supreme Court comes from people being willing and ready to accept its decisions, is there a way to put that back in the box to get the court to be seen as legitimate again? When there's been so many crappy decisions in the past hundred years and the people who are now pissed at the decisions being overturned don't understand like you just have to go the education route and just teach people better. You know, it's just a really complicated problem. Yeah, I mean, uh, on on first pass in response, I would just say the only people who care about SCOTUS quote legitimacy are our law professors and John Roberts and neither are people who we should listen to. And, and so like the Supreme Court has taken on too much lawmaking. So defending it as an institution in its current form isn't worth extending much energy when you think like just, you know, rulings like Obergefell, Bostock, Griggs and McGurr, like that, these are, these are just straight up like manufacturing gay marriage as a right. 
whether you think gay marriage is what, you know, one thing or another, the Supreme Court just straight up made up gay marriage as, as law. After it, it was overruled, uh, or not even overruled, it, it just totally failed a referendum in California. And so, like, I'll push back on your your assessment and say, I don't think those people care about the Supreme Court. I think they care about getting what they want, and I think they want abortion. And the Supreme Court is the fastest way to to change law. People are pissed about that because now they actually have to convince people that abortion is a human right of course they're not going to like this and of course they're going to they're going to challenge the the quote legitimacy of the court because that's what they do when they don't get their way they flip tables yeah it just makes me sad it just makes me sad because you think about how delicately and cleverly each part of this government was designed way back when and we're just it's like we're setting a torch to all of it whenever the the passions of the public decide like, I wish we had that government that was designed for us. And I, I don't know how we're going to get back there other than, as you said, grassroots, changing uh, people in power, national populism, all of those types of things. But I don't think it's something that you can recreate so easily. I mean, it depends on what you want the Supreme Court to be. Do you want it to be a tool for you or do you want it to be more of this neutral tool? And I think to make it a more neutral tool, you have to kind of make it impossible for them to pass laws it's how it's where you put the supreme court do you put it above the legislation or on par with the legislation or do you put it below and i think there's colorable arguments for both but like this idea that the supreme court's not going to be political i mean is debunked just by looking at this year's rulings and and how they how the votes fare to imagine that there's going to be somebody interpret the law in this sort of politically neutral way is not feasible so i don't know i i understand what you're saying but at the same time it's you you have to it's human nature and we're in a culture war and these are participants in the culture war and so again to shift the overton window like let's go clarence thompas you got to root for who you can when you can and until you do that the side that is losing is going to continue to try to tear down the institution. So my, okay, my only thought with that is, and I understand what you were meaning with the Overton window and how we have to actually start fighting back instead of just upholding these principles that make us lose when the other team isn't playing by the same rules. What happens when, let's say we do win, we do get that 60 votes in the Senate and there is conflict within the party now. We need some sort of temper or some sort of hold of tradition, which was what the Supreme Court was originally meant to do, in my understanding. It was supposed to be a check on the passions of the public today. I think that's a useful thing. Like Scalia got uh, 98 votes in his confirmation in the Senate when he was put on the court. That changed when Bork got Bork. Yeah, but do you think Scalia would get that many votes in today's Absolutely not. Absolutely not. So my question is, is there any way to go back to that time when it was legitimate? Because I think that's very useful. No. Okay. Yeah. It's hard to digest, but that's just the way it is. Like, look at who the Democrats are throwing up as their Supreme Court. Like, the reason people got that many votes was because, like, they weren't putting forward the, the first black woman. Yeah. Like, wh- what's her name again? I don't know, but apparently she's just the first black woman. That's where we're at. There probably would be Republicans who wouldn't even vote for Scalia. Yeah. That's very It's true. a different time. <sighs> well... Thank you so much for your time. It's been an absolutely amazing conversation. I knew it was going to be. For those listening, do you have any place where you want them to go find your stuff? Yeah, I'm on Twitter at Bowtide Ranger. I have an Instagram, Bowtide Ranger, um, that I only kind of post my biggest and best uh, from Twitter. And I I appreciate you taking the time. This is great. And and, uh, hopefully we'll, you know, don't be afraid to follow and interact. I try to engage more with uh, followers now. And... I again I appreciate your time. I appreciate what you're doing with this sort of a non-movement and uh and we'll see you guys on Twitter. Awesome. Thank you again.